Hello everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, May 20th. Your show hosts are Peggy George, I'm Lori Moffitt, Tammy Moore, and Paula Noggle. Thanks to Tammy for doing closed captioning for us. Our topic today is Literacy Lessons as Author in Residence. Our special guest is Diane De Las Casas, and I'm going to turn the mic over to Paula Noggle, who will now introduce Diane. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Um, it is, we are so excited to have with us today Diane De Las Casas, an award-winning author and storyteller who tours internationally. Diane is the author of 12 children's picture books, one of my favorites being The Cajun Cornbread Man. She has also authored 12 award-winning professional development books for teachers and librarians, which include titles such as Handmade Tales, Stories to Make. As a champion for literacy, she founded the P Picture Book Month, which takes place every November, and that initiative has been shared on Oprah's blog. When she is doing her residency in schools, she sizzles with enthusiasm and her unique brand of revved up storytelling and has the students participating in adapting traditional folklore through audience participation, writing, singing, and of course, humor. I am fortunate enough to work in a school where Diane has been an author in residence for a week each year for the past, I think, 16 years. I'm not quite sure if that's the right number or not. Our faculty loves her so much that each year we invite her to our Christmas faculty dinner. She is a dear friend, and I consider her a sister I've never had. Um, not only is Diane amazing, but she also has two amazing daughters. And I've known um, and met Eliana. Eliana came, has come to our school several times. Well, Diane works um, in, with us as an author in residence. And her daughter recently won the Teen Chopped Challenge. So they are quite a family of accomplished people. And we are going to give a virtual round of applause as we welcome author and storyteller Extraordinary, extraordinaire Diane Dilkasas to today's show. Diane, I will now turn the mic over to you for you to start by answering our newbie question. What is an author in residence? Hey everyone, I'm sorry but I'm battling a little bit of laryngitis. So today is the first day that I've actually gotten a little bit of my voice back and now I've got that um, raspy, Demi Moore kind of voice. <laughs> so an author in residence is when an author or a writer stays for an extended period of time in a place like a school and they share their insight and expertise. In my case, I do an author in residence in elementary schools where I visit all of the classrooms from pre-K all the way to fifth grade or sixth grade, depending on the school. And I share lessons in literacy and in writing based on my books. So <laughs> thanks for saying my voice is sexy. <laughs> um, so I have actually been an author in residence at Bis Bay Plaza Elementary for 18 years now, and this upcoming year will make 19 years. I have 30 books now, two more coming out in the fall. So um, it's been quite a journey, and I absolutely love what I do. So if you are interested in having an author in residence at your school, one of the things that you can do is, of course, check the author's website to see if they do that. And there's all kinds of funding available. I know that Paula Noggle School gets their funding through a local arts grant. And there are a number of corporations that also give grants to bring authors in and share their art. So it's really awesome. And I'm going to later on be sharing some of the things that I do in the classroom with the students based on my books. 
Um, a little bit about Eliana, my 16-year-old daughter. She is a celebrity chef. She has three cookbooks. She just got a big cookbook deal. So now she's going on her fourth cookbook. Um, her editor is a New York Times best-selling cookbook editor, so we're super excited. And she is the current Chopped Teen Grand Champion. So she won $25,000. She competed against 15 other teenagers, won it all. Now she has also has her own spice company and her own line of cutting boards. Yeah, so we are kind of a busy family. <laughs> she is a superstar. Thank you. <laughs> So I hope I answered your question about what an author in residence is. It's so much fun. So usually what I do is I go into a school and I do a full day and I do like assembly programs for up to 350 students at once, a big performance on stage. And I'm there in a the school for a day. But with a residence, I usually stay for a week. So I come in every day. And I've done residences, mostly at schools in Louisiana, but I've also done them at a school in Chicago and, and other places. So there is, um, it's so much fun. And what's really great is that the students get that one-on-one -on -one contact with a quote-unquote real live author, which is amazing because it really puts your lessons into focus and shows them how they're used in the real world, especially if you're a language arts t teacher or a reading teacher. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today is called The Right Stuff, an author's lessons in literacy. And the picture that you're seeing right there is of our little guy, Captain Deadeye. This is my newest book. It is a chapter book. and. Uh, we've been having so much fun with it. So it's co-authored by my business partner and sweetheart, John Corrett. And it is a book. You can turn to the next slide, please. Or can I do that? There we go. Thanks. Um, it is a book about a little boy who's bullied in fourth grade because he has a lazy eye. And they call him Deadeye John. And that is John's true story growing up. But in the book, his mom, to cheer him up, gives him a treasure. And then he transforms into Captain Deadeye, master of the seven seas. Arr! So through his pirate adventures, he finds the courage to stand up to his real life bully at school. So this past year, I actually used this book as an example and taught methods of writing through the use of my book. So right here you see a drawing that I did on the smart board and it's called The Writership where I explained expository, descriptive, persuasive, and narrative writing. So it, what I did with this is I had the, I didn't do a handout where it's all like drawn out and they just fill in the blank. I really like the experience to be experiential and hands-on. So I had the kids take out paper and actually draw the ship themselves. And it, it was so much fun. And they get really creative with their ships. <laughs> You'll see an example on the next page. So what I do is I uh, read excerpts from my book and explain what expository writing is, which is writing that is factual, descriptive writing, which uses figurative language, persuasive writing, which is writing that is used to convince people of whatever you want to convince them of, such as a book review or a movie review, and then narrative writing, writing that narrates a story. So. I used Captain Deadeye, and I had them design their own Jolly Roger. And if you'll look up there, that is my personal Jolly Roger, which is a pen and a pencil and a light bulb instead of a skull, because every writer has to have great ideas. <laughs> um, thanks for all those awesome links, by the way. Peggy is so awesome. She's like super organized and just gets everything done. <laughs> I love it. So one of the things that I did with this 
is I did a message in a bottle writing activity. So after the students received their explanation of all the different types of writing, descriptive, persuasive, expository, and narrative, they had to choose one of those types of writing and they wrote a letter to someone in their class. And they had to put on the top of their paper what kind of uh, writing they were using. This one, I thought, was super funny because this young boy wrote to his friend and he was writing a movie review, which is persuasive writing. And it says, Dear Hunter, have you ever watched Suicide Squad? Well, I have to tell you, it's the worst movie ever. <laughs> it's, it, it has dark scenery. I mean, you can't even see it unless there is an explosion. <laughs> so funny. The main character, the Joker, is barely even on, is barely even shown. Never watch it. Sincerely, Mia. So obviously, Mia did not care for the movie, and her movie review was a thumbs down. So I worked with the students, and I had them use either a, a expository, descriptive, persuasive, or narrative writing, or they could use a combination. And they delineated on the top of their paper what it was, and then they got to roll up their paper, tie it with a string, and deliver it to their friend in class. And it was really cool. They were so excited to get their messages in a bottle. And the reason I chose a message in a bottle is because that was an integral part of the Captain Deadeye story where our main character, John, who is called Deadeye John, um, writes a letter to the bully whose name is Shark. And he puts it in a bottle and delivers it as a message in a bottle. So that was the literacy activity that I used with that book with the upper grades, third through fifth grade. Please let me know if you have any questions as I go along. Oops, wrong way. Um, so I do lots of different kinds of residencies. Each time I go into Bissonne, because it's my 18th year, I do something different. In this particular case, I did one called Twisted Tales, and it's turning fairy tales into fractured fun. This is, it's such a blast. So this young lady, she's wearing a tiara. She has my book, Cinderellafant, which is a furry tale remix. Furry, F-U-R-R-Y, haha. <laughs> So Cinderella is actually an elephant, and she has two step hippos, and of course the evil stepmother, and a fairy godmouth. There's even a peanut carriage in the book. Thank you, Peggy. <laughs> I appreciate that. I'm really trying to soldier forward with my employees. <laughs> so every time I go into a school, I actually create a binder for that residency, and I have handouts that I used with the students. This is part of one I created for the Twisted Tales um, worksheet. So in Twisted Tales, the kids received a frac I mean, they received a fairy tale. For instance, let's just say um, they received the story of the gingerbread man. And then their assignment was to take that story and fracture it. But of course, you have to give them some parameters. You know, there's going to be a, a rubric that they can follow. So in, what I do is I have them write down what the name of their story is. And you can see on the screen, one was the three little gingerbread girls and the big hungry elf. I thought that was so clever. Obviously, I went around the holiday season, so it was around Christmas. And they used the Christmas uh, theme for their story. So it says, summary of the story. And I asked them to do two to three sentences to summarize the story. Have them list the main characters. And in this story, it was Cinnamon, 
Sugar, the ginger, ginger girl, and hungry elf. <laughs> they chose, their POV was first person. The location of the story was the North Pole. The major uh, element of the story, this is so funny, eating stuff. <laughs> And then um, the protagonist and the antagonist, the big hungry elf, the protagonist is the three little gingerbread girls. And how does the story end? The elf eats the gingerbread girls or house? And the ginger house, okay. And the gingerbread girls live happily ever after without being eaten. I like that. Yeah, so it does give them structure, but it also helps them to create because it gives them a context within which to create their story because you and I know all the, the, the fairy tale motifs, you know. We know those things. We probably know how to fracture a tail without even thinking about how to fracture a tail. But these, these children, all of these stories, a lot of the children have never even been introduced to a regular fairy tale. Um, so on my on the very first page of my Twisted Tale Story Worksheet, I actually have instructions on how to fracture a fairy tale. One of the ways you can do it is by placing the story in a different location. For example, Stone Pizza by Susan K. Mitchell is based on stone soup, and it's set in the southwest desert. The original story is set in a village. Change the main character. Here's an example that I use with my book, The Gingerbread Man Becomes the Cajun Cornbread Boy by Diane de Las Casas. So I use one of my books as an example of how to fracture a fairy tale. Change a major element in the story. Now the story the turn up is a story from Russia. You may know it as the enormous turn up or the giant turn up. But I actually used that story and fractured it, and it became the gigantic sweet potato set in Louisiana with, of course, the sweet potato. So that was the element that was changed. Change the character's motivation. In the original Humpty Dumpty, he just sits and falls off a wall. In Kevin O'Malley's Humpty Dumpty Explodes, Humpty Dumpty becomes a huge motorcycle riding town destroying egg. <laughs> there is a printable template. I can send it to Peggy and she can disperse it. I do have the whole worksheet, which I'm really happy to share with all of you. Maybe we can add it to the live binder. Okay. Um, the other thing is use familiar characters and build a story around them. For example, My Lucky Day by Keiko Casa featured the big bad wolf and one of the three little pigs. So there's so many different ways to fracture a fairy tale, and I go into all of those ways with the students. Change the story's title. Sleeping Beauty becomes Snoring Beauty in a book by Bruce Hale. Use wordplay. Little Red Riding Hood could become Little Red in the Hoodie. Sleeping Beauty could become Leaping Beauty. And then give the stories ending a twist. Of course, characters don't always have to live happily ever after, although in my books they usually do. I kind of like a happily ever after um, ending, especially with picture books and especially with young children. Then I give definitions of, of all of uh, the story um, terms. So, for instance, main character, the characters in the story who have the largest role, supporting characters, characters in the story who have a minor role, protagonist, main character who is usually quote unquote good, the hero, antagonist, main character who is the protagonist's adversary. And then, of course, an adversary is a person, group, or force that opposes or attacks, such as an enemy, a foe, or an opponent in a contest. Yes, they are learning great vocabulary. Thank you for noticing that. Um, do they get to see and discuss each other's worksheet ideas? This is what happens at the end. They actually create stories off of these worksheets. So I have them work collaboratively in a group. So this is group work. 
they create a story together as a group. There are usually four to five students in a group, at the very most six, but I find it's a little bit unwieldy if you do six. So I like to keep it four to five. They create their stories, and then at the end, they get to read their stories. And I actually took it one step further, and I had a contest to get them really motivated. I said that the top three stories would be published on my website. And they were all so excited for that. It really uh, made them work really hard because they love the recognition. Oh, Ms. Pan is publishing my story. A published author is publishing my story. So, you know, it's really cool. And then their parents can see it. Their grandparents can see it. Everyone can see it. And actually, I sent the link to Peggy, which we are adding to the live binder. And it is a link to the winning story of this Twisted Tales um, contest. It was the story of Rapunzel. So they had the story of Rapunzel, and their job was to fracture Rapunzel. And they turned it into Rapunzel with a pretty rat and an evil cat witch. It's so cute. And their intro begins like this, because there were boys and girls in the story, so they had to compromise. The boys love soccer. The girls love princesses. So this is the very first line in the story. Once upon a World Cup, there was an evil cat witch and a pretty rat named Rapunzel. How cool is that? <laughs> um, here's some more definitions that I gave them. Motivation, the goals of the character in the story. Peril, an obstacle or danger in the story that prevents the protagonist from achieving his or her goal. Triumph, the overcoming of an obstacle in the story, a victory. Plot, also called a storyline. It's the plan, scheme, or main story. Point of view or POV. Who is telling the story? First person POV uses I and me. Third person POV uses she, he, it, and they. I usually discourage them from using second person point of view um, just because it's more complex and harder to pull off if they're not super accomplished writers. Fifth graders, I believe, could do a story in, in second person. if They did a combination of uh, first and second person. And actually, Captain Jedi is written in second and third person. So. Um, Lemony Snicket did a really good job with his, a, a series of unfortunate events using second person. But it is a tricky style to use. So I try to simplify it when I'm working with the kids there's, because there's so much stimulation, so much that they're working with. Okay. So I actually, in my worksheet, in my worksheet, <laughs> hey, maybe that's the title of a new book, Worksheet. In my worksheet, I actually have them fill out the, um, the story summary also for the original story title so they can make a comparison. Okay, now I'm going to show you something else. This is something that I did with Twisted Tales with the younger kids. So this would be first and second grade. This is my story of the Cajun Cornbread Boy. And it is a spicy remix of the gingerbread man. So instead of being made out of gingerbread, he's made out of cornbread. And there's a fun refrain that goes like this. Run, shall run, as fast as you can. You can't catch me. I'm full of cayenne. So using the smart board, I do a Venn diagram. And I have them do a compare and contrast with the story of the gingerbread boy and the Cajun cornbread boy. What is similar and what is different? For instance, in The Gingerbread Man, the fox gives a ride to the gingerbread man. In Cajun Cornbread Boy, the gator gives a ride. In The Gingerbread Man, he's a cookie. In Cornbread Boy, he's a bread. Some similarities is that they both have a fox in the story. They both have a song. They have um, an old lady. They both run. So it's a lot of fun to go through that with the younger kids. They're still 
learning, and they're, they're still le really learning how to read and become fluent as readers. And in order to become fluent as writers, they have to be really good readers. So I usually start the bulk of my writing residencies in the third grade, so third, fourth, fifth grade. And it gets really fun when they're in fourth and fifth grade. Um, Paula Noggle can attest how creative their stories get. I usually encourage the boys not to use weapons because boys are all about, oh, I'm going to write a story about ninjas and there's going to be swords. And I'm like, no, guys, we're going to twist this tail without any gratuitous violence. <laughs> okay, let's see. Ah, about questions. Um, yeah, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to ask. I do so many different residencies, but I decided to focus on um, what I've done with my recent book and my Twisted Tales. Fractured fairy tales are so much fun. The kids really, they really understand them. And, you know, it's, all, it's always surprising to me how many students have not read the classic fairy tales and folk tales. How they, because fairy tales and folk tales are so important. They are a part of our, our fabric of pop culture. You don't really understand the humor of Shrek if you don't understand folk tales and fairy tales. Or how could you watch Ever After if you haven't heard the true story of Cinderella? Or when Disney comes out with their version of a fractured fairy tale, um, you know, it's really helpful for the kids to know where the actual stories come from, where they've been collected by the Brothers Grimm, or they're from Charles Perrault, or wherever they come from, or, you know, they come from another country or another culture. Like, most kids don't know that A Thousand and One Arabian Nights had a thousand and one stories that were told by a woman named Shahrazad in order to save her own life so that her head wouldn't be chopped off by the Sultan. Um, you know, the stories like Al Aladdin, Aladdin, comes from the tales of the Arabian Nights. So this, this is a really good context in which to introduce folk and fairy tales when they see how, wow, they're missing so much. It's kind of like with my 16-year-old daughter. I've given her, I, I hope I've given her a good music education. And when she hears a song that has a sample from another song, like there's a song called Gold Digger with Jamie Foxx in it. It's a current, you know, contemporary song. It's not current anymore. It's considered old school by the kids now. But anyway, the real song that they sampled from was an old blues song. And I think it's so important for kids to know where the stories originated. It gives them you know, a bigger context. Um, it, it allows them to be really creative. And when they see a book on the shelf, um, there's so many fractured tales out there, um, especially in YA. That's a really big thing. So if the kids have a good foundation in folk tales and fairy tales, They'll understand those stories. So do we have any questions? Yes, we oh, do. Do the students ever video record themselves reading their stories? Um, I record them. And because of uh, media releases, not all the students have media releases, I can't put them out like on a website or anything. But I do have them as documentation. And if I ever, if I were ever in a a setting where, you know, a closed setting, I might be able to share them. But um, a lot of times when I work in schools, I don't know which students have media releases. So even when I post pictures of the students, I blur their faces. Um, let's see, what other red puns are so I have funny. some, Diane. Yes, please. Do you encourage kids to keep writing journals, and what should they put in them? I do, and I actually give them um, a list of story prompts. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's, in order to be, the best writing comes from rewriting, which is what I always tell the students. So I, I tell them, I said, think of your teacher as an editor. I said, as an author, this is what happens. I turn in my manuscript, my editor looks at it, 
and marks it up with questions like, oh, does this section make sense? Do I need to change something? Or they might make, make suggestions. So I said, don't be discouraged when your teacher gives you a paper and it's all marked up. Consider her your editor and you're so lucky that she has the insight, expertise, and wisdom to be able to give you that kind of advice to make you a better writer. It's like I tell kids that go to PE. Once you get out of school, you have to pay hundreds of dollars a year to get exercise and join a gym. But here, you have your own personal coach. And that's what a teacher is, your personal writing coach. So I do encourage um, the students to keep writing. And some of them actually still keep in touch with me. I have kids that are in high school and out of high school um, who keep in touch with me. It's amazing. Like, they're, they were so uh, touched or motivated by what, by what I taught them. Please tell us more how, about how you manage Skype author visits with students. Ah, Skype author visits. So yeah, I do um, a fair number of virtual author visits. I do more live in person author visits. Like I have three next week. Hope my voice comes back there. Um, but a Skype author visit, I actually have a Skype author visit guide on my website. My website is very um, big because I've been doing this for, I've been visiting schools for over 20 years and uh, 30 books. So I've been working in education and working with teachers for a very long time. I actually do a lot of professional development. And I do a lot of speaking at all the big conferences. But my website has tons of stuff on it that you guys can go through and print out. I do uh, every single book has an educator's guide. I also have all kinds of book activities that go with all of my books. And I always add this value to each book that I do because I know teachers are always digging into their own pockets to fund their classrooms. I see it every day. So I want to try and make it as easy as possible for teachers to use my books in their classroom. So I do a lot of lesson plans and developing curriculums. Um, so there is a Skype author visit guide. And it delineates everything on how to bring me, or even any other author, in, in for a Skype author visit. So typically what happens is we set a date. and just kind of like what we did, Peggy, with you know running a, a little tech check. We do that before the visit. Some schools don't use Skype. Some schools have their own um, platform like you guys do with uh, Classroom 2.0. You use Blackboard Collaborate. Some of them have their own platform. So I'll, I always make sure that I'm familiar with their platform. Um, some, some schools will use Google, Google Hangouts. I, did a recent Skype visit, not a virtual author visit, with a school in North Carolina that was a virtual charter school that had students logging in from all over the world. So we were talking to students. John and I were talking to students in Sweden and, and all over the United States. Super cool. Wonderful. Oh, if you don't have the budget for an in-person author visit, um, a virtual author is, is a great way to go. It's typically a, you know, a fourth of the cost to bring mm -hmm. an author in. <laughs> Excuse me. You can spend 30 to 45 minutes with the author. Some authors will do a slideshow. Some will read from their book. I typically do an actual performance and then take Q&A. So that's what um, a virtual author visit entails. It's fun. It's so much fun. How have you had students publish their finished stories? You mentioned about the contest uh, and have they blogged their finished stories, put their stories on a blog. Now, some teachers, like Paula Noggle, go the extra mile and have their students uh, publish their, their work on the, blog, on the classroom blog. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, not every teacher does that. After I leave, it, you know, I do encourage the teachers to take the step further, and it, it is always up to the individual teachers. Mm -hmm. um, but I do love that these students, you know, they they really get. Mo it's it's amazing how just one or two visits with them motivates them so much. And I think it's because they see what they're learning put into practice in the real world. 
They see, mm -hmm. oh, I'm writing today in class, but look what Miss Diane has done with it. Look at this book. Look at the spine. Look at the jacket. You know, look at how the book is printed, how it's, uh, how it's put together. So, you know, that's all, all the authors, they love, they realize that they're real people who put in mm -hmm. real work. <laughs> Excuse me. Those were the questions that I was able to capture that you didn't answer during the, the show. Does anyone else have any questions for Diane? You can type them in the chat. Oh, you said wonder why that is that kids, you know, I think that um, kids are not exposed to nursery rhymes, fairy tales, mm -hmm. and folk tales as much anymore. You know, part of it is um, there's just that curriculum. There's not enough time to read in the classroom. There's so much testing. But I think it is important to get these kids, this is like their literacy basics. They mm -hmm. need to be fed these stories so that they can know the context in which movies or other books come out and they, they look at it and say, oh, that's based on Cinderella. Oh, that's based on Sleeping Beauty. Um, this is a, a, there's so many out there that are, um, so many YA titles that are fractured fairy tales that are New York Times best-selling books. Hmm. I'm trying to... Um, I'm trying to think of some examples. Um, oh my gosh, what's that one by Disney that was based on a book? They have a whole series. It's really popular. They become movies. They become TV series. Oh, there's Once Upon a Once Upon a Time. There's that series. I've enjoyed watching that for a while because I knew all the folk tales and fairy tales that they were mixing together. And it's like, oh my gosh, look at what they've done with um, Rumpelstiltskin. Ah. How do you teach them storytelling skills? Um, one of the things that I teach them is how to use, see with storytelling, the only thing that you need are your face, your facial expressions, your voice, of course, and your body. So face, voice, and body. So I teach them that with these three things, your face, voice, and body, you can tell amazing stories. You, you don't need anything fancy. You don't need a backdrop. You don't need costumes. You can actually just tell a story with your face, your voice, and your body. And um, when I simplify it like that, they're like, oh. And then I teach them different ways to narrate a story. For instance, if you're telling a story, your voice as the narrator is your mid-level voice. So that's your narrator voice. But if you want to become um, a big animal like a bear, how would you make your voice? You would go lower in timber. So you would be like this, I'm a bear. And then if you want to be a high squeaky animal, which I can't do right now, like a mouse, you would take your voice up a couple of octaves. So I teach them how to use their vocals and how to use their bodies in effectively conveying a story and, of course, you know, using eye contact. You never want to rest your eyes more than three seconds on any one person in the audience unless you're making them part of the story because it makes them very uncomfortable. So mm -hmm. when you're telling a story, you know, you're, you're telling to the audience and you're scanning, but you never want to, like, focus on one person. Is that it don't start to shift and be like, why, why me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of audience participation, too. I actually have a book called, um, oh my gosh, why can't I work? I'm having a, a brain bubble right now. Um, is it, it's um, Tell a Tale. It's playing with storytelling, and it, it teaches you how to tell an, an audience interactive story. Oh, look, Susie says a lot of my students don't know them, or nursery rhymes either. I know, isn't that crazy? They don't know them. And I think it's, part of it is that we have a lot of young parents who never learn them. Part of it mm -hmm. is that teachers just don't have time to teach them the classics. Like, 
um, you know, it's, it, it surprises me when I hear of a child that doesn't know Cinderella, and I'm like, what? <laughs> it's my all-time favorite, favorite fairy tale. Paula's been waiting patiently to contribute. I'm going to turn the mic over to Paula, and I do have another question to ask after that. Sure. Hi, Diane. Um, I've been racking my brain because I remember one of our first interactives that you did was you taught my kid how to juggle using scarves. And I don't remember what the literacy tie was, but I was wondering if you could um, share with us yeah, I know that you do a lot of whole body um, activities. I do in my lots of, yeah, so that one was, um, it's called Story Fest. And what I did was I had them, uh, we created a story theater script, and then we acted it out using the scarves. And that was really fun. They, they loved it. So, you know, we got to the, we create the story as well as, acted out as a class. So um, that was a long time ago, but yeah, that was so much fun. And I think one of the most positive things that you offer students is that you have no fear of getting down and dirty, being silly, you know, changing your voice, rapping, whatever. So because That's it. I rap. I, I get silly with the kids. And I think they, they feel like, that, that's why when I walk into Biss and A, um, I usually have to check and make sure the hallways are clear because if I don't, I'm going to get mobbed because they remember me year after year, even though I only spend a week there. Isn't this right, Paula, how they, they just like, Miss Diane, and they're yelling down the hall, and they're, they're running up to me and giving me hugs. It's really awesome. But I think Definitely. that's when you show up, it's important, important. They, it's important that they see their role models, you know, they, they, they see these people that they think are so high and mighty. I'm like, oh, she's a real person. Oh, she, I, I saw one of the students at a local grocery store and they said to me, and I'm sure they do this to you too because they think you sleep at the school, Miss Diane, you've shopped at Walmart? And I was like, yeah, girl, prices are low. <laughs> You are definitely a rock star when you enter our hallways. Yes, the kids will come screaming up to you. Uh, when they come in, it's so funny because um, they, they're they like, you know, they don't want to listen to me. They want to hear you. <laughs> you know, it's, it's because I come in as a celebrity and then I leave as a celebrity, but you guys do the, the down and dirty work every day. Um, I just feel like it's my job to maybe bring in a new idea or two and inspire not only the students but the teachers because I think that a lot of teachers sometimes will get stuck in a rut and they have this, their, their staid lesson plan that they use year after year and they don't, they don't have a lot of time to think outside the box to create new things for their kids to do. That fit within the standards. That fit within their testing schedule. So, you know, I come in and I bring some new ideas, get the kids uh, really motivated and inspired, and in turn, inspire the teachers as well. I actually captured two questions as you and Paula were, were talking. Uh, do you ever use close activities when you're telling a story and, and stop and leave out a word so they can add possible words? What I do is what I call the dramatic pause. Mm -hmm. where they, I, I'll tell a story and then I'll pause and they just fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You do that. Mm -hmm. I do that a lot. Okay. Um, I see here someone, you wrote that some of the classic fairy tales are on banned booklets. And then Susie said, Grim Brothers are really grim at times. That's so true. Most people don't know that in the true story of Cinderella, collected by, the, by Charles Sproul, I believe. So Step sisters actually, one cuts off her toes to fit into the shoe and the other cuts off her heel. In Rapunzel, Rapunzel got pregnant and that's why the witch threw the prince out of the window. You know, those are the kinds of things we're not going to leave in the story for the kids. Mm -hmm. But knowing the context in which those stories come from is, is very helpful, especially when they are introduced to new media that features fairy tales and fractures fairy tales. Mm -hmm. 
And finally, what do you think of Reader's Theater activities? I love Reader's Theater. When I do it, I call it story theater because I, I try to get the kids to learn their, um, their roles, their parts, their lines, um, instead of reading from a script. Mm -hmm. So I take it one step further and I turn them into storytellers. So when they perform, they'll go up on stage. What we, a lot of times I do when I do my story theater residency is I have the kids perform a story theater together as a class and they get to create like the refrain in the story and they get to use instruments and sometimes they rap and they chant and they mm -hmm. dance and then we perform it for all of the other students in the same grade level so they all each get to see their each other's story. Wonderful. <laughs> Excuse me. It is so much fun but I love Reader's Theater and I think it's really important to get the kids not just writing, but seeing that writing come to life, performing it, reading it out loud, hearing the cadence of the words, hearing the beautiful figurative language. That to me is what really brings literacy all together, is when you see it in action. Mm -hmm. One more question, are there other authors in residence around the country? There are lots of authors who, who do um, residency work. My advice is to check with your state's um, arts, what is it, um, Louisiana has like, what is it called, the arts, um, every state has a listing of artists and, you know, in visual arts, performing arts, literary arts, um, music, so each state has a listing of artists who do that and for us it would be literary arts and there are a lot of authors who do residencies in schools so that would be the first place I'd look to check for those lists and then you can also check um, like with young audiences they often have authors who visit schools and may do residencies as well. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thanks so much for, for presenting to us today. I think everybody uh, really enjoyed listening to your stories and, and how you connect literacy activities uh, for students. Thank you. It, it's so much fun. I, I just I absolutely love what I do. Oh, there's one other thing that I've done with uh, Fractured Fairy Tales mm -hmm. that I know Paula, Paula thought was really fun is we turned it into board games. Mm -hmm. There's so many things you can do with Fractured Fairy Tales. Um, so I encourage all of you teachers to look at fairy tales and folk tales and, and the things that you can do with them. You can turn them into reader's theater. You can turn them into board games. You can have the kids make a song or a rap out of them. There's so much that you can do with them. Mm -hmm. Oh, maybe that's my next book. <laughs> <laughs> Story gonna, rap. Uh, there you go. I'm going to turn over the mic to Peggy, who's going to tell us what's coming up next. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Diane. I can't stop smiling. This has just been delightful. I mean, your personality and your sense of humor is fantastic, but your ideas are even better. I wish I could be in one of your residencies. I just think the students are so lucky to have these kinds of experiences with you. So thank you so much for sharing with us. Oh Just to God. let everyone know, we have some great shows coming up. However, next weekend we're taking a little break because that's Memorial Day weekend in the United States. So we'll take that Saturday off. The following Saturday, Mark Moran is going to be back with us and sharing all about the new revisions in the Sweet Search Engine for Kids, which is really outstanding. And he's also going to be um, talking some about the Choose to Matter initiative, which um, is fantastic. June 10th, we are thrilled that Nikki Robertson is going to be with us and she will be our featured teacher but she's really a librarian and I know that she has tons of great things to share with us. 
And then our final webinar before our summer break, we're going to have an open mic show. And we're going to have what's on your summer bucket list. Paula's going to facilitate that for us. So start thinking now about what you'd like to share on the microphone that's on your summer bucket list and what you're going to be doing or looking forward to this summer. It can be personal or professional. So plan ahead and join us for that. Then we'll take our month off and we'll be back on August 5th. And I hope you'll be able to join us for that. Also, just a quick reminder that the 4T virtual conference is going on right now. It started today, and it will go for three days. They have fantastic sessions going on there, all related to integrating technology in teaching and learning. And um, they're all held in Blackboard Collaborate. So if you just go to that link, and it's also in the live binder, you can get the link for the schedule for each day. And it provides you with a link to join each session. And they're also recorded. So if you are interested in something and can't go to the live session, be sure to check out the recording. And Lori, I'll turn it back to you to finish up. Thanks, Peggy. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargett on latest. He's gathered all his PD resources in one place, including host your own webinar, where, where you can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate session. And as long as it's public, it's free. You can nominate a featured teacher at this site. Also, there's a link in the live binder to do that. You can also nominate yourself as a featured teacher for the month. The video collections on iTunes U. When you exit the session, the survey should open up in your browser. You can also go to the direct link, take the link from the chat, or the link in the live binder. And when you do that, at the bottom, you can request a professional development certificate. It now prints out your, with your name on it. Thanks to Patty Ruffing, who also sends them out. Um, make sure you have a personal email address for receiving these, so otherwise schools tend to block this from getting to you. Special thanks to our special guest, Diane De La Casas, to Steve Hargadon, founder of Classroom 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in this show today. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs>